Hello and welcome to another episode of Ask the Consistory. I'm your host for this video, Reverend Jake Zabel of the St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church located in Dolby, Queensland, Australia, a member congregation of the Confessional Orthodox Evangelical Lutheran Communion. Uh, Ask the Consistory is a video podcast produced by the Co-Elk and this is where we address your questions. Today I'm addressing the topic of the Mark of the Beast. Particularly, I'm going to address the question of, is the COVID vaccine or the vaccine passport the mark of the beast? I, I've seen this going around the internet a lot, especially from your kind of dispensationalist, more Baptist, um, reformed, evangelical churches where, you know, they always have to find something that is the mark of the beast, the single mark of the beast, and this is the mark of the beast, and this proves the end times is about to take place, etc, etc. And the most common one floating around at the moment is either the COVID vaccine or, by extension of that, the vaccine passport, which many countries are now suggesting that they want to do, that you can't do things unless you have been vaccinated. Um, this, this kind of dispensationalist view on the Mark of the Beast pops up all the time. There's things like, you know, is it like a barcode tattoo or is it a microchip or... It's a whole wide range of things. But today I'm going to give you the Lutheran and by that I believe the biblical view of what is the Mark of the Beast. And so to understand this and to address the question of whether the COVID vaccine is the Mark of the Beast, we need to first answer four simple questions. The first one is, how do we read the book of Revelation? The second one is, what is the beast? The third one is, what is the mark? And the fourth one is, what does it mean to buy and sell or not being allowed to buy and sell unless you have the mark? And so to address this question, I've actually got a number of resources that I'm going to be drawing from to answer this question. One will be the Missouri Synod Lutheran Study Bible. Another resource is going to be a commentary on the book of Revelation written by Revere Franklin Wiedner. This is uh, published by Justin Sinner Publications. Uh, another book I have is The Judge is at the Door. This is a commentary on the book of Revelation written by Wilhelm Peters. He's a pastor from the old Evangelical Lutheran Church of Australia, the Missouri Synod sister congregation that existed in Australia from the 18 kind of 30s through to the 1960s. And so this is the book. Uh, it's available from the Evangelical Lutheran Congregations of the Reformation. They have reprinted this book and they have the current copyright on the English translation of the book. It was originally written in German. They have the English translation. They've got the copyright on it. So you have to contact the Evangelical Congregations. So you have to contact the Evangelical Lutheran Congregations of the Reformation or the ELCR in Australia and talk to them if you'd like to get a copy of this book. Uh, another book I'm going to be looking at is Where Earth Meets Heaven, a commentary on Revelation by Pastor John Strellen of the Lutheran Church of Australia. Uh, this was originally published by Lutheran Church of Australia by their um, Lutheran publishing house uh, as part of their Cairo commentary series. That series isn't around anymore. I don't believe the publishing house even exists anymore but you can actually get a copy of this book because Pastor Strelin went and got it self-published uh, through some other publication thing. If you just Google uh, Where Earth Meets Heaven by John Strelin, you should be able to find uh, a copy of the latest printing of this book. And another book I'm drawing on is a Concordia Popular Commentary Revelation by Lewis Bright, and this is published by the Concordia Publishing House. So if you want to get those there, all the places you can find those books. That's a lot of books that I have looked at for this topic. I've also, one other thing that I've got is the frequently asked questions of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, also known as Wells. They give what I believe is a very good concise answer regarding the mark of the beast on their frequently asked questions. So I will look at that as well when we get to the section on the mark of the beast. So let's start by looking at how we read the book of Revelation. So the problem with 
dispensationalist, Baptist, evangelical theology is that they tend to treat the book of Revelation as if it is only a book of prophecy of future events. And so they look at the book of Revelation and they go, okay, this is stuff that's going to happen in the future, in the last days, in the end times. Now, they are correct in the fact that the book of Revelation is referring to the end times. Where they err is when they think the end times will exist. Because these churches are generally premillennialist, they think the end times refer to the time of the millennium. Jesus returns to earth, there's some kind of secret rapture, then there's a thousand years before Jesus comes back again, and there's a battle of Armageddon. You know, you know what I'm talking about if, if you look at the kind of Left Behind series, American evangelical kind of understanding of the book of Revelation. But if we read the book of Acts, we can see that St. Peter says that the prophecy of Joel is fulfilled with the day of Pentecost. And the prophecy in Joel is referring to the end times. So in Lutheranism, we hold that the end times is the period after the ascension of Jesus. After Jesus ascended and he sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, this now marks the beginning of the end times. We now are in the end times. We are in the millennium. Lutherans are our millennial, which means we don't believe in a literal millennium. What we believe is that the millennium refers to a long period of time, and this is the period of time from the ascension to the second coming of Christ. So we are currently in the millennium. We are currently in the end times. We currently are in the book of Revelation. It is only the last few chapters of Revelation where we talk about the second coming of Christ, the final judgment, the new heavens, the new earth, uh, Satan and them being cast into the eternal lake of fire. Those things are things that haven't happened yet. The rest of the book of Revelation is referring to things that have happened and are happening. Um, the book of Revelation is constantly talking about things that refer to the death of Jesus. Uh, for example, the battle in heaven between Michael the archangel and Satan and his angels. It actually refers to this as happening with the blood of the Lamb, which is the crucifixion of Jesus. So Revelation 12 in this big battle in heaven is not referring to some kind of battle at the end of time or even some kind of great angelic battle um, before the fall of man. It's referring to the crucifixion of Jesus when the powers of God triumphed over the powers of Satan, that Jesus disarmed these powers and authorities, as Colossians tells us, by his death on the cross. So revelation is something that is either happened in reference to things like the crucifixion or things that are currently happening. And so Within Lutheranism, and I'm going to, again, when I say Lutheranism, I'm saying Biblical Christianity, we don't believe that Revelation is necessarily only stuff that's going to happen in the future. Much of it has either happened or is something that's a kind of ongoing thing. And this is going to be reflected in like the Lutheran understanding of the Antichrist, in the fact that Lutherans believe that the Antichrist is the Pope. And we don't mean that there's any one specific pope, whether it be like Pope Leo, who tried to kill Luther, or the current pope, Pope Francis, who is kind of liberalizing the Catholic Church. It's not one particular pope. The Antichrist refers to the papal office, this, this office that puts itself as the head of the church and puts itself in the place of Christ. The Antichrist is not one individual like the dispensationalists believe. The dispensationalists believe that the Antichrist is one individual and we're waiting for that one individual to rock up. Lutherans say, no, the Antichrist is here now. He is already in the world, as John tells us in John's epistle. The Antichrist is in the world. And the Antichrist is the papal office. It's, or, and that's established that by the time of John writing his epistles in 90 AD, he says the Antichrist is already in the world. The office of Pope was already established by then. And so the Antichrist is the papal office. It's this office that puts itself in opposition to Christ. And so it's not one individual Pope, it's all the Popes of the Antichrist. Even Pope Gregory the Great, which the Book of Concord quotes and that we think is a great church father who probably will end up in heaven, he is an antichrist by virtue of holding the papal office. Because it's not the individual who's an antichrist, it's the actual office that's 
the Antichrist. And this is going to come up again later when we talk about the beast and the mark of the beast, of them not being a single individual or a single thing, but being multiple individuals and multiple things, in the same way that the Antichrist is not a single individual, but is multiple individuals. And so we might as well just get on to now what is the beast. And so when we get to Revelation 13, there are two beasts mentioned. There is the first beast, who comes from the sea, and the second beast who rises up out of the earth. Now, the second beast in Revelation 19 verse 20 is identified as the false prophet. So we can associate the second beast with this false prophet, this man of lawlessness, this son of perdition, the Antichrist, the, the man mentioned in Thessalonians, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition, the Antichrist referenced in the epistles of John, and the false prophet or second beast referenced in Revelation. This is the same um, figure. But then there's this first beast, and who is this first beast? Now, the hard part is trying to say exactly what Lutherans teach, because many Lutherans, both present and past have argued over the identities of these beasts. I'm going to take the position of what I believe based on the kind of majority position and kind of the standard kind of traditional position in Lutheranism. Now I know some people may disagree with my interpretation here and you know the book of Revelation is a symbolic book and it's not 100% clear of what is what but I'm going to give you my arguments also for why I believe what I believe and also quote some earlier Lutherans on this topic to show that this isn't just my belief that I'm actually drawing on the experience and knowledge of, you know, men smarter than myself who have gone before me and what they said. So generally this first beast, we get a description about this first beast as having ten horns and seven heads, but then in verse 2 we are told that it was like a leopard with the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. And this is significant because when we go back to the book of Daniel chapter 7, Daniel refers to these four kingdoms appearing. There is a lion, then there's a bear, then there's a leopard, and then there's this unnamed creature that kind of, kind of sounds like a dragon. So I like to just say lion, bear, leopard, dragon, even though Daniel doesn't specifically tell us what the fourth beast is. He just kind of describes it, and in my head it kind of looks like a dragon. But Daniel talks about these four beasts, and scholars traditionally, from the early church up to now, have identified these four beasts as Babylon, Persia, the Greek or Alexandrian um, kingdom or empire, and then the Roman Empire. And these are identified with things like that the lion is some symbol in Babylon, the bear is some symbol in Persia, the leopard is a fast creature with four heads in the book of Daniel, and that it's fast, and so this looks to the fact that Alexander spread his empire really fast and then died very quickly, and his empire was divided into four, uh, the main ones being the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, but there was the other two guys as well that the empire of Alexander got split in four. And then the last beast is identified with the Roman Empire, based mainly on the fact that during the existence of the fourth empire is when the Son of Man, who is Jesus Christ, appears in this revelation in Daniel. So you can connect it all together, see that Jesus came during the time of the Roman Empire, the fourth empire. And so these beasts are associated with empires. Now, in Wiedner's commentary, he looks at earlier Lutherans that existed before him, and there's a Lutheran by the surname of Williams, who makes this big point of identifying how Daniel went with the order of lion, bear, leopard, and John goes leopard, bear, lion, that there's a reverse order. And he explains this as that Daniel was looking forward to empires that were to come, whereas John is looking back at the empires that have already come. And so by this we can see that these, these beasts, which are associated with these different empires, are now associated with this one beast in the book of Revelation. And so since the previous beasts were identified with different empires, we can tell that this beast is also identified with kingdoms and empires. 
that this beast is made up of these pre-existing empires. That it's not one empire, but multiple empires. And it's the empires, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, that kind of persecuted the um, Jews and the people of God. And so we can see that this beast here is a reference to kingdoms and empires and government, in particular, that persecute Christianity. And again, we can look at more of the book of Revelation and some of the things that the beast does. And we can see how it wages war on the people of God, how it wages war with Jesus. That this beast, this first beast, is a representation of the anti-Christian governments. All governments that oppose and persecute Christianity. Not all governments, because there are neutral governments and there are pro-Christian governments, but any anti-Christian government is epitomized and represented in this beast. And just to grab some quotes from other people to show that I'm not the only person who thought this, uh, Wiener quotes a whole bunch of different people who also believed this. Uh, Particularly, Wiedner wrote that he said, Daniel saw four beasts representing four kingdoms. St. John sees one beast uniting the characteristics of the four. So Wiedner goes on to quote Williams, who points out that Daniel's four beasts are all combined in this one beast in Revelation, who says, this appears to indicate that he represents some great principle of evil found in all the heathen kingdoms. So it's, it's, it's not one kingdom, it's, it's all heathen kingdoms. You also get in Brighton's Concordia popular commentary where he says that the beast represents and symbolizes every human authority and everything of the human nature that the dragon can corrupt and control and use in its warfare against the woman, the church, and her seed, Christians. Political, governmental, social, economic, philosophical, and education systems, as well as individuals. No one entity or person at a given time in history will exhaust what the beast signifies. So he's saying that there are, again, there are multiple fulfillments of this beast. It's kind of everything that opposes Christianity, whether that be political, social, economic, educational, as long as it's anti Christian, it is represented in this one beast. Uh, I'll grab particularly as well John Strellen in his Cairo commentary on Revelation who wrote, In Daniel's vision, the four beasts represented four different empires and political powers. By combining all four beasts in one, John is saying that this beast epitomizes all political power. So again, we see from these scholars that the beast in Revelation, this first beast, isn't a single figure but is all anti-Christian governments, all anti-Christian powers of the world, the social, the economic, the philosophical, that oppose Christianity. And so you have in these two beasts, the first beast and the second beast, all that opposes the church. The first beast is the world, it's the culture, it's the government. Any time that the culture and the government opposes Christianity and tries to make us deny Christ, or it persecutes the church, that is the first beast of Revelation 13. The second beast, this false prophet, is the Antichrist. It is the Pope, but it's also any kind of religious body, whether that be non-Christianity or be kind of attacks from within the church that attack Christianity and persecute Christianity that promote error and heresy in the church. You kind of have bound up in these two beasts, the world and the kind of the false church attacking the true church. And that is what you find in these two beasts. And so the first beast is basically anti-Christian governments. And so now what is the mark of the beast? Well, what is most interesting is that you always hear people have these theories of what is the mark of the beast? Could it be a barcode? Could it, could it be a microchip? Could it be the vaccine? Could it be the vaccine passport? Well, actually, the book of Revelation tells us exactly what the mark of the beast is. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 17, it says that so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. And later, in Revelation 14, verse 11, it again talks about those who worship the beast and its image and who receive the mark of its name. The mark of the beast is the name of the beast. 
And so what does that mean? Well, what does it mean to have the name of something on you? Well, to think as a Christian that we have the name of Christ on us. To think in baptism that we bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. We put that triune name on you in baptism. So to be marked with the mark of the beast means to have the beast's name put on you. The name represents loyalty and ownership. Are you loyal to Christ or are you loyal to this anti-Christian government? And there's other parts in Revelation that show you that this is what the name refers to. So you have in Revelation 9.4 talks about God putting his seal on the foreheads of the believers. You have this again mentioned in Revelation 14.1 where it says that those who have his, that's Christ's name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And then again when you get to Revelation chapter 22 verse 4 where it talks about the Christians being in the new heavens and the new earth. It says that they will see his face, this is God, they'll see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. So the name is is not some kind of physical thing. It's not like a marker or a tattoo or a barcode or something written on your forehead and on your hand. The name is referring to where your loyalties lie. And do you have the name of the government on you or do you have the name of Jesus? And again, when I say the government, I'm not meaning any government because, you know, I can be an Australian citizen and a Christian. But if the Australian government is going to start opposing Christianity and saying that I have the choice of either worshipping the government or worshipping Jesus, then I will say no to the government and I will worship Jesus and I will rebel and I will not see myself as an Australian citizen if they are demanding that I must sacrifice Christ in order to have that Australian citizenship. You know, Peter tells us that we must obey God rather than man. Doesn't mean we can't obey both God and man. If the government is either pro-Christian or just kind of neutral to Christianity, where we can worship both God and obey the government, where we, where we can obey both God and the government, then that's what we should do. But if there is a situation where we must obey either God or government, then we must always choose God. And it's that choosing God that is to have the name of God on you. But choosing the government means to have the name of the government or the name of of the beast, which is the mark of the beast. So the mark of the beast is the name of the government. Now, before we move on to, I want to quote some other resources here. I want to talk about the beast and which beast are we receiving the mark from? Because it does get a little bit confusing here. Because we start talking about the second beast and then we talk about this mark of the beast. But I believe that this mark is actually referring not to the second beast, the false prophet, but to the first beast, the anti-Christian government. And the reason I say this is twofold. First, to understand this, I'll just read for you chapter 13, verses 11 and following in the book of Revelation, where it says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants to worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666, or 666 to be exact. Now, what is interesting there is, which beast does this number belong to? And you might think that it belongs to this second beast because it's in the section of the second beast. But actually, it refers to the first beast. And this is because when you get down to verses 14 and that, you have where the beast, the second beast is referred to it. And the first beast is referred to as the beast. And so it says that it, 
it deceives those who dwell on earth. The it here is the second beast, telling them to make an image of the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. That is referring to the first beast. The first beast was the one who was wounded yet lived. So the second beast here is the it and the beast is actually the first beast. So when the second verse says it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, the it is the second beast and the beast is the first beast. And so when we start talking about the name of the beast and the mark of the beast and the number of the beast, the beast in this section is a reference to the first beast. And to confirm that this is actually correct, I want to turn back to Revelation 14.11, when it refers to people worshipping the beast and its image and those who receive the mark of its name. So the name, the mark, and the image all go to the it, and the it refers to the beast. Now, the beast who had the image made was the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived, which was the first beast. It was the first beast that had an image made after its likeness. And so when we talk about the beast having its image, we're referring to the first beast. And its image is connected with its mark and its name. So therefore, it's not the second beast, the false prophet, but it's the first beast, which I have explained earlier is anti-Christian government. So the mark of the beast is referring to the mark of the first beast, the mark of the anti-Christian government, which I said before, Revelation tells us that the mark is the name of the beast. And so this mark of the beast is the name of the beast. And that name represents loyalty and ownership and devotion to whatever your, your name is coming from. So to have the name of Christ means that you are a Christian, that you believe in Jesus, that you obey Jesus, that you're loyal to Jesus. To have the name of the beast means that you worship the beast, you're loyal to the beast, you obey the beast, and the beast, as I said, is anti-Christian government. And to, again, prove that this isn't just something I've made up, this is just some crazy thing that Pastor Jake has come up with, I'm going to quote other people who have gone before me and tell you what they have said. So, particularly, I'm going to grab again uh, Revere Franklin Wiedner's book, and here he is quoting... Uh, theologian by the name of Blunt, or his surname is Blunt, and he writes, This mark of Antichrist is plainly imitated of the seals of God, which the faithful received on their foreheads, and as a seal is identified with the new name of Christ and the name of God, so the mark of the beast is elsewhere called the mark of his name. So, again, that's not really telling you what the mark is. That's showing you that the mark is the name of the beast. It's not some microchip or some vaccination or some tattoo or anything. The mark is the name, and the name is loyalty and devotion to the beast. Again, if we grab Pastor Wilhelm Peters, the judges at the door, he writes, The mark of the beast's name therefore steps out into the open whenever, in any way, people in an anti-Christian matter give the glad eye or make love to the world, give room to the spirit of the times, try to serve Christ and the world at the same time, waver between two alternatives, not allowing God's word only to rule them. Who therefore does not accept this mark, who namely does not conform to the heterodox or the unbelieving world, but who walks straight through without consideration towards others in life and doctrine, adjusting himself strictly according to God's word, to God's word, will, as formerly in Popedom, also be outlawed, persecuted, despised and ridiculed, and must bear the marks of the Lord Jesus." So there Pastor Wilhelm has said that the mark of the beast is when you give in to the world, to the unchristian world, and that you sacrifice the truth of Christianity for that truth or the false truth which is taught by the world. And again, to grab what the frequently asked questions from the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, I believe that they give probably the best concise answer regarding the mark of the beast. What it is, 
and also what it means to not being able to buy and sell unless you have the mark comes from the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod in their frequently asked questions. And so they say, the mark in Revelation 13, 16 is a symbolic way of denoting ownership. Those people belong to the beast. By way of contrast, consider how Revelation 7, 4 describes God putting a seal on his people. That symbolic sealing identified them as belonging to God. Those verses illustrate the truth of Jesus' words. Whoever is not with me is against me. There is no middle ground when it comes to Jesus Christ. Regarding Revelation 13, 17, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name, Dr. Siebert Becker offered his explanation in Revelation, the distant triumph song. So here, let's now quote Pastor Becker. This mark gives them the right to engage in commerce and to participate in the economic activities of the community. The sort of thing spoken of here is illustrated in many communist countries, where one must openly demonstrate allegiance to the atheistic form of government in order to participate fully in the business world as well as in the world of politics. In many of those countries, for example, young people are denied a higher education and entrance into the professions unless they join organisations for communist youth. Thus, in a sense, they cannot buy or sell unless they have the mark, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So to repeat myself, what is the beast, what is the mark, and what does it mean that you can't buy and sell unless you have the mark? The beast is the anti-Christian government. It is the first beast of Revelation which refers to anti-Christian government, the anti-Christian world. The mark of the beast is the name of the beast, which denotes loyalty and submission and devotion and obedience to that. You have the choice of having the name of Christ or the name of this anti-Christian world. And so to have the name of the beast... To have the mark of the beast is to reject Christ and to have complete loyalty to the beast. And that if you don't do these things, you'll be persecuted. You can't buy and sell. You can't live a simple life in this realm unless you deny Christ and you give in to the beast. And there are two examples that I can think of that best represent the mark of the beast. Because, again, what I said earlier is that as Lutherans, and by Lutheran again I mean Bible-believing Christians, we don't believe the Antichrist is a single individual, but he is multiple individuals because we believe the Antichrist is the office of Pope. So too, the beast is not a single individual, but is all anti-Christian government. It's not one single person, it's not one single government, it is all governments that oppose the church are bound up in this beast. So too, the mark is not a single act. It is not a single marking. It is not a single thing. It's not a vaccine or a passport or a microchip or a barcode or any one little individual thing. The mark of the beast is anything and everything that would have us deny Christ and submit to the government. Now, again, we can have obedience to the government. Jesus says that we should obey the government. Paul tells us to obey the government. But when we get to a situation where the government says you have to obey them or Jesus, then we must choose Jesus. And that question of the do this and choose the government rather than Jesus, that is the mark of the beast. And one of the best examples I can think of this is... In the early church, Christians were told that they had to offer incense to Caesar and say that Caesar is Lord, otherwise they'd be put to death. Here, Christians were being asked to burn incense to Caesar and to deny that Jesus is Lord and to call Caesar Lord. That there is the mark of the beast. It is a mark of the beast. Because in doing so, you are saying that you are not going to believe in Jesus and instead you are going to believe in Caesar alone. 
you are going to reject the name of Jesus and instead you're going to put on yourself the name of Caesar. That is the name of the beast. So this burning of incense to Caesar and this declaration that Caesar is Lord, that is a mark of the beast. And we see this again in modern days if you go to the Islamic world where they'll say to you, you got to say things like, Allah is one and Muhammad is his prophet, otherwise you'll be put to death. That is a mark of the beast. That is the mark of the beast. So don't think of the mark of the beast as a single thing. Think of the mark of the beast as different marks and think of a mark of the beast because in reality the mark of the beast is rejecting Christ and denying Jesus and believing and worshipping the culture and the government and the world in opposition to Christ. That's the mark. And so there are little things that are done which are marks, you know, plural. So these are a mark of the beast that are going to lead to you having the mark of the beast placed on you, such as burning incense to Caesar is a mark of the beast. And in doing that, you have the mark of the beast that is denial of Jesus, rejection of Jesus, and submission and worship of this anti-Christian government placed on you. And so the question now is asked, is the vaccine or the vaccine passport the mark of the beast, or more specifically, a mark of the beast? And I'm going to say, no. No, it is not a mark of the beast because you don't have to deny Christ in order to be vaccinated. If we look at the examples of burning incense to Caesar, you had to deny Jesus in order to burn incense to Caesar. You had to reject Jesus in order to say that Caesar was Lord. You don't have to deny Christ and reject Christ in order to be vaccinated. You may not want to be vaccinated. You may oppose the government trying to force vaccinations on you. You may see it as um, a violation of your rights and your freedoms. If the government says you have to be vaccinated or you have to have a vaccine passport in order to do things, that may be a violation of your rights. But that's not the mark of the beast. Because the mark of the beast is something in which the government says, deny Christ and do this. That's not what the government's doing in this situation. The government is actually doing the opposite. The government is saying, be vaccinated and then you can go to church. Be vaccinated and then you can go to these places. The government is saying, you have to deny Christ in order to get the vaccine. If the government said that, that would be a mark of the beast. If the government was saying you have to deny Jesus before you're allowed to be vaccinated, that's a mark of the beast. But the government's doing the exact opposite here. They're saying if you don't get vaccinated, you can't go to church. If you get vaccinated, we'll let you go to church. Now that's an abuse of power. That's a violation of our rights. That's a violation of religious freedom. But that's not a mark of the beast. And Again, if we look at this vaccine passport, where they may say things like, you can't buy or sell unless you've got the vaccine and the vaccine passport. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a mark of the beast. Just because the government put restrictions on how we can buy and sell doesn't mean it's a mark of the beast. Not unless, in order to get that thing, we have to deny Christ. This here is an Australian $10 bill. The Australian government says that I can't buy or sell in this country unless I use the Australian dollar. I mean, we have digital currency, like on your, you know, credit card and debit card, but they're all still the Australian dollar. They're just a digital form of the Australian dollar. I have to use this $10 note if I want to buy and sell in Australia. Does that mean that this currency is now the mark of the beast? Because the government is saying that if I don't use this, I can't buy and sell in this country. That doesn't make this the mark of the beast, or a mark of the beast. If the government said, you can't have an Australian $10 bill if you believe in Jesus, you have to deny Jesus before you're allowed to have a $10 bill, that would then turn this $10 bill into a mark of the beast. If the government says you have to do something in order to buy and sell in this country, that is not necessarily a mark of the beast. It is only when the government says that I have to deny Jesus in order to possess that which I must use to buy and sell, then it is a mark of the beast. I mean, if we look at scripture, 
what it says in Revelation, that only those who had the name of the beast could buy and sell. Now, if you could have the name of the beast without denying Christ, then it's not a mark of the beast. But in order to get the name of the beast, you had to deny Christ. And that's the issue. It's a mark of the beast when you have to deny Christ to get something. If the government has said you have to be vaccinated and you have to have a passport or some sort of certificate that says you got vaccinated in order to buy and sell, that's not a mark of the beast. It's a violation of your freedoms, it's an abuse of power, it's oppression from the government, it's whatever you want to call it, but it's not a mark of the beast. But if the government turned around and after establishing those laws that said you had to be vaccinated and you have to have a vaccine passport, and then said you can't get a vaccine unless you deny Jesus, that would then turn the vaccine into a mark of the beast. If the government starts insisting that I have to reject Jesus in order to get the vaccine, that now makes the vaccine a mark of the beast. Because they're saying now that unvaccinated, you get to continue worshipping Christ, but you have to deny Jesus in order to be vaccinated. That would be a mark of the beast. So... Until the government actually says, hey, you have to deny Jesus in order to get the vaccine and then to get a vaccine passport so you can buy and sell, it's not a mark of the beast. It's a mark of the beast when we have to deny Jesus in order to do whatever this thing is, whether it's burning incense to Caesar, saying Muhammad is the prophet of Jesus, or anything. I mean, if the government said, hey, you can't have a job in this school unless you deny creationism and teach evolutionism, that's a mark of the beast. So all those schools, whether they be Christian or, pub or public, where they say you can't teach creationism, you have to deny creationism, and you have to believe in evolutionism, that is a mark of the beast because that's forcing you to deny God's word. Whenever the government insists that you must reject God or God's word in favour of what they want you to teach and believe and do, that is a mark of the beast. When the government says, you must deny Jesus in order to do something, that is the mark of a beast. Such as in communist countries, where they said you couldn't be Christian, you had to be an atheist. And so you couldn't do things unless you denied Christ. You couldn't do things unless you denied the Bible. That is the mark of the beast. Saying that you have to have sort of medical treatment in order to do something is not a mark of the beast. It, it may be wrong, you may oppose it, you may object to the government trying to mandate vaccines. But a mandatory vaccine is not a mark of the beast unless the government starts insisting that you have to deny Christ in order to be vaccinated. Or if the government did something like they said, alright, if you deny Christ you don't have to get vaccinated. That would turn the vaccination into the mark of the beast. So the government started saying, all right, you get vaccinated and you're allowed to worship. If you don't get vaccinated, you have to deny Christ in order to not have the government force a vaccine into you. That would be a mark of the beast. But at the moment, just having the government say you have to get the vaccine and you have to have a passport to prove you got the vaccine in order to go into a shopping centre, that's not the mark of the beast. It just... Because the government is trying to force you to do something doesn't necessarily mean it's a mark of the beast. I mean, the government says you have to wear a seatbelt in order to drive a car. That, that's not a mark of the beast. If the government said you had to denounce Jesus in order to drive a car, that's a mark of the beast. Until the government starts insisting that you have to deny Christ, that's not a mark of the beast. If the government insists that you have to reject Jesus and his word, that is a mark of the beast. Sorry that this video is a lot longer than normal, but it's an important topic that we need to address and I really needed this amount of time to address it properly rather than just the standard five to 10 minute videos that we normally do for Ask the Cons History. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and if you have any questions for the consistory, please email us at our email address, coelk hyphen atc at hotmail.com. I've been your host, Reverend Jake Zabel. Goodbye, God bless, and keep the name of Jesus on you.